Hi guys, Geechu64 here, and today, in honor of the end of the decade, we will look back at some of the best movies of the year. Obviously, this list is completely subjective based on what I enjoyed the most this decade. These may not be the most technically superior movies, that's all I'm just saying. They are simply my favorite movies, starting from 2010 till now, at the close of 2019. You will see a lot of movies you know, but maybe some movies you don't. I had a really hard time putting this list together because there are just so many movies. Um, now, I did manage to narrow this list down to 50, so I hope you guys are ready for the truth. Oh, geek. True. 64. Geek. Truth. Geek. Truth. 64. Oh, shit. As you can see, I'm going old school with the green screen with this video. I'll be splitting this list into two parts because it's just so massive and all of these movies can pretty much be shifted up or down in multiple places. I wanted to do this list as a big thank you to my subscribers because you have made this year awesome. It has been amazing. So let's go ahead and get down to it with number 50, John Carter. Poor marketing by Disney and Taylor Kitsch as leading man helped lead this movie into bombing. Uh, unfairly in my opinion. I thought it was a fun sci-fi movie, easily on par with Avatar. I wish more people would have checked it out because it built an interesting world that I would have liked to have seen more of. John Carter has gained a bit of a cult following since its release and with good reason. I'm glad to see it is getting at least some attention well after its box office runs complete. Number 49, Ender's Game. Based on the Ender Saga of books, this movie stars Asa Butterfield, Haley Steinfeld, and Harrison Ford, among others. Now, I hadn't really read the book before seeing this movie, so I went in with no expectations, and I love this movie. It felt so different than most movies I saw this decade. It was about uh, adults raising kids to fight in a war against alien bugs that we don't know anything about. Uh, but there are some real like morality questions here. They gave it so much dimension. It's sad that we never got the sequel. Number 48, Pacific Rim. Going with three sci-fi movies right off the bat. Pacific Rim was the first solid kaiju movie that I'd ever seen on the big screen. It showed what a Power Rangers movie could be. It showed what a new Godzilla movie could be. The story was very straightforward. There are giant monsters coming out of a rift in the Pacific Ocean. And people have to fight them with giant robots. That's basically it. Uh, the characters were fun, but there was still a sense of impending doom, and Idris Elba yelling about canceling the apocalypse is just great. Number 47, Cabin in the Woods. You won't see too many horror movies on this list because they aren't necessarily my cup of tea, and most horror movies I just don't find very good, but I loved Cabin in the Woods. It is somewhat of a horror movie, but it's also a comedy. It takes a fun look at the horror genre. It takes a group of college students in a remote force cabin and have them uh, deal with zombies, but it is the technicians running everything that make this movie. I don't want to get too into it just in case you missed Cabin in the Woods, but this is one of those movies that throw everything and the kitchen sink. It's just, it amounts to a lot of fun. Cabin in the Woods is great. Number 46, Life Itself. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Roger Ebert. I loved watching Siskel and Ebert at the movies back in the day. As a kid, it blew my mind that there were these two guys who watched movies for a living and they just got to talk about them. They had a whole show where they just talk about movies. They got to see them early. This was before the internet, so movie reviews were not that big of a thing. It was just through like word of mouth and newspapers, magazines. So when I got this movie, Life Itself, I expected it to look back at Roger Ebert's life because he had passed away the year prior to this releasing. And it does have those backstage looks, but it actually chronicled the last few months of his life and are cut with interviews from the biggest names in Hollywood. This movie hit the heartstrings so much so that I went ahead and bought the book. Life itself is a heavy movie, but one that I still haven't forgotten. Number 45, Joker. Yep, it's only been a few months and I need to see it again to really get a good feel for it, but... I like this take on the character. It felt like an Elseworlds story in the best ways possible. This isn't like the definitive Joker origin or anything like that. It is set up in a way that this is one of many. There is no real answer, and I loved that about this movie. I love the setting of the 80s, 70s rundown Gotham. Joaquin Phoenix is amazing as a Joker, and I never thought I'd like another Joker as much as I, Heath Ledger because uh, he nailed that. He hit a home run. But Phoenix was solid in this, uh, and seeing the decay 
of this character into madness was enthralling. And this movie uh, is proved what DC can do if they let more of their movies breathe in their own universes instead of trying to copy Marvel and shoehorn everybody together. Number 44, Straight Outta Compton. I'm a sucker for good biopics, and this one was solid. Very well paced and interesting throughout. You had O'Shea Jackson Jr. playing his dad, Ice Cube, in the movie. And not only was he a good actor, which surprised me, he looked so much like his dad that I had to double take in the movie because I really just thought the filmmaker somehow had a time machine and went back and snagged Ice Cube from the 80s. Honestly, most musical biopics follow similar stories with very little deviation. But there's something very intangible about this movie that makes it hard for me to put a finger on why I like it so much. I've seen it so many times, um, but I do. And I've watched it many times and it still hasn't gotten old. It's one of the biggest surprises of the year. Number 43, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. From the trailer, I was caught up in this movie. It was so visually different than anything else I had seen, like a comic book left right off the page. And the movie didn't disappoint. Now, I wasn't as big a fan of some of the frame rate choices, but that didn't take too much away from the visuals. I think they handled uh, Miles Morales' story very well here. Uh, but the big surprise to me was the older Peter Parker, who I would argue stole the show. Using the Spider-Verse here was just a wise choice. My only qualms would be that I wanted to see Spider-Man 29 in more than just an after credits cameo, because Spider-Man 29 is awesome. Number 42... Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Now, I had zero expectations for this when I sat down with my friend to watch it. It looked like some throwaway, straight-to-DVD movie you'd find in the bin at Walmart. But man, <laughs> was I wrong. I was cracking up while watching this story about these two hillbillies just trying to enjoy a relaxing weekend fishing while a bunch of college students attacked them because of a misunderstanding. Um, just like Cabin in the Woods, Tucker and Dale poke fun at the horror genre to great effect. If you have not seen this one, do yourself a favor and check it out. Number 41, Edge of Tomorrow. Or Live, Die, Repeat. Seems like they couldn't really settle on a title. This is another movie I walked into with little expectations. Really, I just expected a Groundhog Day action movie, which it is on the surface. But you have the military fighting aliens in mech suits. You have the end of the world. It's just it's threatened and in your face all the time. You have a cowardly public relations officer learning to fight and be a man, basically. Um, played very well by Tom Cruise, might I add. But Emily Blunt is also amazing here. Seriously, how was she not cast as Captain Marvel? Marvel, that's like your biggest misstep of the decade, not casting Emily Blunt as Captain Marvel. Also, in this movie, you have Bill Paxton in one of his last roles with some great lines. Edge of Tomorrow is more than a great action movie. It is also some great sci-fi. Number 40, Ready Player One. I told you there would be some movies that are on this list just because I had fun with them. I was a big fan of the book when this movie was announced. Of course, the movie isn't as good as the book because it never is, but Spielberg delivered a solid romp through the universe. Um, a lot of people claim this was a nostalgia movie and it had no substance. And yes, there's obviously a lot of nostalgic references here, but there's reasoning behind why that is. The future world is depressing and people are looking back at pop culture, specifically from like the 80s and 90s, for comfort. There are no creative ideas anymore in this world that we're talking about. Eh, it sounds kind of like where we're heading now. <laughs> they, uh, I just think this movie was overlooked and underrated. Uh, it's not meant to be a really deep thinking movie. Ready Player One is very watchable and enjoyable. Number 39, Avengers Endgame. What a way to cap off the series. Yes, I know that technically the MCU is continuing, but with Iron Man and Captain America exiting the series, the MCU will never be the same. And I'm honestly not that impressed with Marvel's upcoming slate of films based on what they put out so far. However, Endgame was easily one of the biggest cinematic events of the decade. And its three-act structure feels more like three completely separate films. Uh, because of that, it makes it hard to rewatch in one sitting. Um, it has pacing problems and lacks the same punch as Infinity War. However, there are some great character conclusions and some amazing scenes. Uh, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be but it was still a good conclusion to the saga, easily earning a spot on my list. Number 38, Aquaman. One of the biggest surprises to me was this DC entry. I had all but given up hope on the DC films with Batman v Superman, Suicide Squad, and Justice League being 
terrible to barely passable, Aquaman came out of nowhere to deliver a straightforward classic tale with just amazing visuals. This is one of the best looking movies of the decade, in my opinion. We had octopuses playing drums and sharks with laser cannons. It was totally off the wall. Jason Momoa transferred this character of Aquaman into a surfer bro, and he just wanted to chill out at the bar. <laughs> there was also some great uh, uh, supporting cast in this movie. You had uh, Amber Heard, uh, Tamara Morrison, Nicole Kidman, Patrick Wilson, William Defoe, and even Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren was in this movie. Number 37, Her. Joaquin Phoenix pops up again on this list. In her, we get a man who develops a relationship with an AI virtual personal assistant voiced by Scarlett Johansson. Her is basically like an extended episode of Black Mirror taking place in the not too distant future. So it does have a sci-fi setting. But really this movie is just, it's a small film. It is really about this lonely guy who doesn't really connect with people. He isn't a recluse or anything. He just doesn't quite connect with them and understand them. Seeing the strange relationship with his AI grow is both beautiful and disturbing, and I love the ending. If you have not seen her, I highly recommend it. Number 36, Whiplash. One of the best movies of 2014, Whiplash was a big surprise. One of my friends told me about it, and then I saw Jeremy Johns hyping it up, so I had to see it. There is this story about a guy wanting to be the best drummer was elevated by great performances by Miles Teller and even more importantly, J.K. Simmons. I don't put much stock into awards, but Simmons rightfully won Best Supporting Actor from the Academy Awards for his role as an angry conductor. Seriously, this guy is a major a-hole and he is uncomfortable to watch uh, knowing that he could fly off the handle at any moment, screaming in your face, throwing things out at you. Um, he honestly reminded me of the instructors in basic military training. He is just challenging this talented kid to be better, but he is so terrible in an entertaining way. J.K. Simmons was awesome. Number 35, Kick-Ass. What an off-the-wall movie. Now, I worked at Blockbuster when this was released, and I still have the poster we hung up in the window because I love Kick-Ass. Kick-Ass honestly feels so much older than what it is. As I said, I worked at Blockbuster when it came out. I was surprised it was released in 2010, which allows me to talk about it here. Uh, from Nicolas Cage freaking out his big daddy to Hit Girl brutally taking down bad guys, seeing this eight-year-old girl just take down full-grown men is utterly hilarious. Not to mention the main character played by young Aaron Johnson. This was pre-Quicksilver. He delivers a serious yet fun tone as the title character. Just a kid trying to do something to break up the monotony of life. He just wants to be a superhero and wants to see what how, how that will work out. A spoiler doesn't work out so well for him. You also got Mark Strong as an evil businessman and his son played by McLovin. The cast was great. The tone was perfect. And this is highly rewatchable. I love Kick-Ass. Number 34, Mad Max Fury Road. I had zero expectations going into this. I wasn't a big fan of the previous film starring Mel Gibson. I didn't hate him, but I just didn't really care too much about him one way or the other. And thought a reboot sequel didn't make much sense coming out in 2015, 30 years after the last movie. But director George Miller delivered one of the most eye-catching movies of the decade with mostly real effects and stunt work. The color palette was amazing. Now granted, the movie is basically just an escort mission from any random video game. You can pick whatever one you want. And Charlie Theron as Furiosa is arguably the main character. Definitely more so than Max in my opinion. But what this movie lacked in story, and more than made up for it, which is over-the-top action sequence and apocalyptic setting, it was a far cry from George Miller's last couple of films, which included Happy Feet and Babe, Pig in the City. <laughs> Number 33, Inside Out. Overall, this decade wasn't the best for Pixar, with them focusing on mostly subpar sequels. But Inside Out stood out for the originality that Pixar was once known for. With the movie taking place inside a little girl's head, emotions were embodied by different characters, memories were represented in interesting ways, it dealt with some great themes of growing up and changing, it was colorful and creative, and really stuck with me well after I left the theater. It isn't one that I've rewatched too much because it is hard to recapture that initial feeling I had watching this, so I don't want to I don't want to overplay it. But Inside Side Out was easily one of the best animated movies of the year and easily made it onto my list. Number 32, Interstellar. 
The first Christopher Nolan movie on the list, but it won't be my last, I guarantee you that. I was so hyped to see this. I was so hyped to see Interstellar. Christopher Nolan doing a sci-fi space film starring Matthew McConaughey. What's not to be excited about? <laughs> While it didn't quite live up to my expectations, it is still a solid entry into Nolan's filmography. The effects were a sight to behold in the theater. If you were lucky enough to see this in IMAX, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Hans Zimmer is at his best with this soundtrack. I love the Interstellar soundtrack. I love the planets that were visited in this movie. I like the uh, setting of the not-too-distant future. People don't believe in the moon landings. Society has regressed to some extent. And food is scarce. There is a heart to this movie as well. There's really a lot to love here. Even if it isn't Nolan's best, his weaker films are still so much better than most people's best effort. Number 31, Tron Legacy. A sequel no one expected to a movie that was really only popular in niche circles. No one really knew what to expect with Tron Legacy, but man, <laughs> did this movie deliver. For 2010, these effects blew me away. The first real use of CGI de-aging with Jeff Bridges, it looks kind of janky now, but at the time, it looked pretty amazing. It made you think how they did that. Uh, the particle effects as people got derezzed was awesome. The computer world, the, the bigger questions of life and where it comes from. Older Jeff Bridges dealing with uh, a bit of a god complex in this movie. I also love the costumes that updated the original in a sleek new way, but are still clearly recognizable as being from Tron. Honestly, this is one of the best sequels ever made, taking into account the time span between the two films. And let's not forget one of the best things about this movie, which is the soundtrack. Daft Punk was perfect for this movie. I listen to the soundtrack all the time. Tron Legacy left a great legacy, pun intended, I guess. Again, it's just too bad we never got that planned sequel. Number 30, Dread. I will admit that I had zero interest and this movie, I hated the Stallone version of Judge Dredd and was never really a fan of the comics. But when I finally saw this movie on my friend's 3D TV, I was blown away. The whole movie takes place in one building. You don't really see much of what the world outside is or how it functions. But this building is so huge, it's basically its own city within a bigger city. And it is ran by a drug boss played by Lena Headey. The whole movie is Dredd played by Carl Urban, trying to get to the top of the building. He is aided by a young woman with psychic powers as well, and the drug being pushed by this drug boss is called slow-mo. It slows down time for the user, making for some really cool action scenes. Yes, the movie is similar to Raid, but that doesn't take away from how awesome it really is. And once again, we were cheated out of a sequel with Dread 2. Number 29, The Lego Movie. Anyone who thought this movie was going to be good before the trailer had to be lying. I honestly was expecting some terrible story to push merchandise onto kids, but this movie was so much more. It was about growing up in some ways, but connecting with your inner child in other ways. But even more than that, it was a funny movie. There were so many jokes thrown your way that you can't even catch them the first go around. There were some great Easter eggs and crossovers that I never thought I'd see, like Star Wars, DC, Ninja Turtles, and more all in one film. The main character of Emmett, played by Chris Pratt, is great as this hapless guy who is supposed to be the chosen one. Will Ferrell as Lord Business is great. The look of the Legos are so awesome that you just swear that you were watching stop motion at times. They looked amazing. And the live action scenes really tie into everything. The Lego movie was so much better than it had any right to be. Number 28, Skyfall. Skyfall was the epic conclusion to Daniel Craig's Bond. It, its sequel, Spectre, was a massive disappointment, and I have little interest in the new movie coming out in 2020. Casino Royale was amazing, and Quantum of Solace was pretty forgettable. Skyfall, however, was amazing. Right there with Casino Royale, top-tier Bond. We open up with the Bond being shot. Uh, he's presumed dead. He goes off to retire in secret, but has to come back into the game to take down our villain, played by Javier Bardem, who <laughs> will go down as one of the best Bond villains of all time. Judy Dench's M gets more to do here than in any other movie, and we explore a little bit of Bond's past in a way that we never have in any of the other movies. Skyfall may be the highest this franchise will ever get. Again, that, that, that is just coming from a lifelong fan. I don't see it ever per surpassing Skyfall. Number 27, The Martian. Cast away in space for this decade. 
What a cool movie. And just like in Saving Private Ryan, Interstellar, and the Bourne movies, the government spends a lot of money on Matt Damon. The story of this guy stranded alone on a planet trying to survive and make contact with Earth is great. You feel like you're right there with him trying to survive. The movie does a great job of making you feel claustrophobic while also giving you a sense of uh, being in the middle of nowhere. There's tons of space, but nowhere to go. You're literally alone on a planet. There's also a great supporting cast trying to rescue him, which break up any potential monotony of just having Matt Damon in a movie. This is a movie I've rewatched several times, and it hasn't gotten old. Number 26, Wreck-It Ralph. This was the movie that really showed me what Disney Studio could do. I was so excited by this trailer that had all the video game characters. It took place in an arcade, so I figured it was going to be like Toy Story, but with video games. But getting into the movie, I just really love the character of Ralph. He's supposed to be the bad guy, but he really wants to be the good guy. And no matter what he does, he doesn't seem to be able to escape that hole that people put him in as the villain. So... There's a solid message to this movie, but it's also a lot of fun with great puns about candy and sugar rush, uh, which is basically just Mario Kart cross with Candyland. And there's some fun cameos here. Wreck-It Ralph is one of Disney's best films of the decade, displaying the originality they were once known for. Number 25, The Adventures of Tintin. Spielberg is on the list again. I never really knew anything about this character Tintin other than it was a comic strip so I had no expectations going in but man was this great this felt like an Indiana Jones movie this felt like the Indiana Jones movie that the fourth Indiana Jones film should have been there was lots of action and adventure there was mystery and like hidden treasure the action was off the charts something that uh, is hard to pull off in, in live action but what they did felt so comfortable in this movie in Tintin and the 3D was great. I usually try to avoid 3D, but this was arguably the best 3D movie that I've ever seen. If you have a friend with a 3D TV, <laughs> get this on 3D, Blu-ray, watch, definitely check it out. But even if you don't, it still has great visual uh, appeal. It is, and the story's awesome, great effects. Number 24, The Dark Knight Rises. Christopher Nolan concluded the amazing Dark Knight trilogy with Rises. And while I didn't like it quite as much as the first two, it's still a solid movie and a worthy conclusion, and certainly worthy of being on this list. We start off with a broken Batman who is broken even more throughout the movie than how he started. You have Anne Hathaway as Catwoman, which is awesome. Um, Tom Hardy in an unlikely casting as Bane, which has spawned many a meme this decade. The idea of closing off the city in this movie was fun enough, but I think it may have worked better if Joker was included as it was previously written. But Regardless, the Dark Knight tore down Bruce Wayne in order to build him back up and ultimately save the city, capping off the trilogy in great fashion with solid themes and even bigger set pieces than we saw in the previous two movies. Number 23, Kingsman Secret Service. The best Bond movie of the decade wasn't even a Bond movie. It was this old school take on the spy films of old with a dash of comedy and 2010's wit. It played with the genre in all the right ways while still maintaining reverence for that material it was based on. Matthew Vaughn brought the same magic he brought to X-Men First Class in this movie, but gave even more. Building up this universe of spies in training, newcomer Taron Egerton was great <laughs> in the lead role, and I loved Sam Jackson as a villain with a lisp. Colin Firth actually stole the whole movie with his action scene in the church with Freebird playing in the background. It's one of the most memorable scenes of the decade. The action, drama, and comedy were nailed here, it's too bad the sequel, The Golden Circle, was just so terrible. Oh, well, at least we have this one solid movie for this decade. Number 22, 21 Jump Street. Wow, what a weirdly completely random placement on the list. 22 is 21 Jump Street. Uh, well, 21 Jump Street was based on a TV show from the 80s that few remember. So there was no real built-in audience for this blockbuster. It makes me wonder how it was greenlit in the first place. It was sold as a Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum comedy. And this was arguably both of them at their best. Uh, definitely in the comedy category, if you ask me, this was the best ones that they've done. This is easily one of the funniest movies of the decade and one that I've watched many times. Uh, the car chase scene is one of my favorites, playing with the idea of everything exploding in action movies. And of course, the real fun comes from Hill and Tatum having to switch traditional roles. <laughs> Seeing Channing Tatum 
deal with this decade's version of high school versus how he remembered high school being was something that I not only thought was funny, but I could identify with. That would be me if I went back to high school. <laughs> Honestly, I'd be one strapping my backpack too. Uh, the sequel to this, 22 Jump Street, was basically a copy of this one, and it was very self-aware of it, but 21 Jump Street was obviously the superior comedy making it onto my list. Number 21, John Wick. Saying this is the best action movie of the decade is not a stretch, and it came from out of nowhere. The first 30 minutes build up this idea of how deadly this guy is before he even throws a punch or shoots a gun. If those guys would have just left his dog and his car alone, John Wick could have uh, retired in peace. But no, you had to awaken the man you get to kill the boogeyman. Bad idea. <laughs> this movie had... Some of the most realistic action sequences with clean, precise, hand-to-hand -hand combat mixed with gunfighting that I hadn't ever seen in a movie in the way they were presented here. John Wick didn't flip around like a ninja or pull off over-the-top fighting styles like Jason Bourne. It made the action feel grounded, <laughs> even though the movie took place in this over-the-top underground world of assassins. And the world building here was solid, something that uh, the sequels expanded on. But it was the first one that sticks in my mind when it comes to John Wick. Just no way you can recapture that feeling of surprise I had walking into the theater and seeing John Wick. It was just amazing. And that is it for part one. I hope you join me in the conclusion to this list where we will go through the final 20 as well as honorable mention for those that just missed the cut. I want to thank you guys so much for checking out this video. I'm very interested to see what some of your favorite movies of the last decade were. As I said, this list was hard to make, so if you didn't see some of your favorites, they may just be in the next video. Either way, comment below, let me know what you think. Uh, thank you subscribers for being awesome as always, and if you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, share it, do all the YouTube stuff, or don't. I'm not a beggar, I'm G264, and I'll always tell you the truth.